Thank you. Thank you very much for, for having me. Um, I like the concept. I'm, I'm very uh, honored to be part of this, um, of this series. So um, this paper is going to be very different, I think, from, from what you, you, you've seen so far. So I'm, I'm um, uh, hoping to get a lot of, of, of questions and, and interactions with, with the audience. Basically, the, uh, at the origin of this paper is, 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 is a paper that I was asked to, ask, to write for a practitioner journal. Um, and, I, and I did that with, that with that spirit. But I think there is a number of deep academic questions that I've, I'm touching upon. I, I still don't quite see a path to, towards like putting it as a more academic paper. But if some of you are good at writing and see a path, then just let me know um, and uh, let's have a chat about that. But the core of this was, was uh, just like descriptive stats basically to send to a, a, a practitioner and journal. Um, but I think they are pretty surprising and, 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 and it's a, the, the, the private equity is a seven trillion industry. It's clearly, you know, the, the, the growing asset class and, and, and it seems to be the future. So um, I think these descriptive stats and these observations might, uh, might be of interest. So do let me know um, if you have questions or suggestions or, or if later you want to talk about uh, um, how to spin a bit this evidence in different ways. So, I think that, that I want to place it, again, it's not going to be like a usual talk. Um, I want to, to make it a bit bigger picture as well. So I would like to uh, discuss a bit what financial intermediation in the 20th century was and what we did in terms of research in uh, financial economics. Basically, in that world of the 20th century, the, the enterprise value was 80% equity, 20% debt, roughly speaking, with this equity being publicly listed uh, and the debt mainly privately held by, by some banks or others and a bit on, on, on publicly listed as well on the, via the, the bond market. And uh, we spent, when I started my PhD in 2000, the hot question was the question of IPOs and it was, this puzzle that there was this underpricing and then there was the cost as well. We, we couldn't understand why an IPO was 7% uh, transaction cost. Why would a bank charge 7% of the equity value uh, to do an IPO? And back then that was like, you know, the hot topic, like are there conflicts of interest? Is it like key pro quo? Like, like what's that? Okay. We couldn't get our head, head around it. But basically, if you think about the cost of financial intermediation, i.e. bring the savings of people all the way to the companies, um, it was that you, you, raise, you raise money in an IPO, you pay 7% to the bank, and basically then the money channeled from institutional investors and retail to the companies. And then if companies are issuing debt, they pay like 2% of the, the debt value. And, and that basically the cost of financial intermediation. There is a bit more cost, there is some transaction cost as well. You need to rebalance, there will be some price impact, but we also spend ages trying to assess, you know, it's, it's, it's good we bring the money to the companies, but what is the price impact when one wants to sell and things like that. And so they say the economist long puzzle, like in the 90s, the early 2000s, that was the literature. A lot of the literature was around these issues. Also the issues of mutual funds. Mutual funds was a very hot topic in the early 2000s and, and, and in the 90s. Um, and, and one of the key questions was, well, these mutual funds are taking the money from retail investors, bringing it to the companies, and they seem to be charging a lot for it. They, they charge these, like it was back then, like 2% fees uh, for this intermediation. Uh, they also had some front load charges, uh, back load, etc. And so we were puzzled about the cost of these mutual funds. Why do they trade so much? Why, why does Advent cost so much for retail to, uh, to uh, bring the money to companies? And we talked a lot about conflicts of interest when you manage over people's money. So the literature on mutual funds is literally hundreds of papers that look at things like kickbacks, uh, incubation of mutual funds, all kinds of tricks that people would use to divert this other people's money to their benefits. And, and we spend ages on that uh, uh, in, 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 in financial economics. And maybe as a result of, of academic work, um, we have got to a world where the regulation is pretty tight. The SEC basically, it was quite a funny thing to watch in, in the late 90s, early 2000s, where the SEC would do catch and uh, a, 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 a 
a catch game with with uh, uh, like cat and mouse with 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 uh, uh, financial intermediaries whereby when the academics would write a paper and say, well, I suspect these guys are like incubating funds and doing this and that trick, then the SEC would investigate them and would, would, would write a, a regulation to clamp down that, that uh, channel. And so academics were talking a lot about all these conflicts of interest. The SEC was going after each one of them, trying to close them. And all this academic evidence on the cost of intermediation and so on, we didn't bring down the price of IPOs is still 7%. So Google tried to do something different recently, but um, at, or at some point, but, but, but it's still pretty much 7%. But the cost of like mutual funds went down to very low because they have, most of them have been, even the active ones have reduced their fees a lot. And then there has been all these passive uh, mutual funds and the like to the point where there is not that much money anymore to be made in mutual funds. Um, but we're still doing some research on it. Um, so, so that's the 20th century world, right? And in the 21st century, we just jumped to a different world. Basically, we, we have left this, this public equity type of world, and then we went into private equity type of world. To give you two data points, in, uh, in the mid-90s, um, um, pension funds was roughly invested 60-40, uh, with 60% in equity and 60% mainly in public equity. Uh, today, there is as much in public equity as in private equity on aggregate for pension fund portfolios. Uh, it's very much the case as well for endowments. So it has been a massive replacement for large institutional investors. You have this, this chunk of private equity that is now about the same size as, well, as the public equity exposure. It's pretty striking. So we change world. And so what is the cost of financial intermediation in that, in that new world? So I did some back of the envelope calculations here to see a bit the numbers, and I think this is quite new as well, um, but it's just back of the envelope and um, calculations for, for leverage buyouts, right? So it's, it's not growth capital, venture capital, I'm, I'm focusing on leverage buyouts, which is the bulk of the money in private equity. So basically, imagine that in a given year, you have about 60 billion of earnings by the set of companies that go under LBO that are going private. And they are bought at an enterprise value of 10 times the earnings, which is 600 billion then. And we split the equity value one third, two thirds. So one third equity, two thirds debt, um, which is let's say roughly what it is, okay? So it's 600 billion is divided in 200 billion of private equity and 400 billion of private debt. Now, just to show that these numbers are actually adding up with the different things we observe, there is currently one trillion of assets under management in private equity, LBOs, and that coincide with a 200 billion of equity value, uh, given the leverage and given the appreciation over time of, of this value. Then you have the acquisition cost. How much does it cost to do, uh, to acquire the equity uh, in, in, in a private equity transaction? And uh, my best estimate is that it's not far from 3.3% enterprise value. It's actually a bit more. Um, so if you include all these due diligence, legal costs, charges to, to, to by GPs and so on, we are talking about 20 billion of fees to deliver this private equity. So the 200 billion of private equity to be delivered to companies costs 20 billion to initiate. So if we go back to the cost of IPOs, we, are, we have changed a bit dimensions here. Um, we are talking about something even more expensive than the IPO that was already puzzling us before. Um, and intuitively is that whenever you have a private equity transaction, you have hundreds of people spending thousands of hours doing due diligence and researching everything. Because you know, if you're buying an entire company like this, like you just buy Hilton Hotels and there is no inform public information or anything like that, it's gonna cost you tons of money to do your due diligence. So it's a very, very expensive thing. Um, the borrowing costs, we typically ignore that, but you need to pay like two and a half percent of the value of debt. So if I borrowed 400 billion, it's 10 billions of cost to, 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 to get that, uh, um, that debt. And then now, as the debt is actually, often we have in mind that it's just like the bank gives the debt and the bank gets two, two and a half percent and that's it. Um, it's, it's not quite just that, it's that the bank, even if they initiate the debt, they usually go on the institutional investor market, uh, what they call the, the financial markets, to, to, to sell that debt. So if the bank lends, they take that loan and then either via CLO or something else, 
they sell it back to pension funds and endowments. Um, and, if, and if it's not a bank, but a private debt fund that do, does the transaction, then the private debt fund raises the money from the pension funds as well. So our pension funds and endowments basically still hold the anti-company, but they hold it with two separate buckets. They have from the equity, the private equity buckets has the equity, and their debt bucket now has uh, uh, this 400 billion here of debt via CLOs or private debt funds, et cetera. And for that, they are paying quite a lot of money. The people who are raising private debt funds charge something like 1% uh, uh, fees plus uh, a carry often. Uh, the people who are in the CLOs vehicles are also charging fees. And so you have quite a lot of money over the lifetime of a loan. So here I took like four years. Um, it would be like 5% in total of the value of the debt that would have been paid each year for four years as a fee. And so that's how I end up with a 20 billion. Uh, and the equity provision as well, you need to, the private equity funds are gonna raise money and gonna charge fees for it. And here I estimate that it is a very least $50 billion. So to have created this intermediation here over a four years holding period, these are all the fees that you are facing. And so that's pretty steep. Um, it's actually way beyond uh, what it was in the old world, uh, which was already puzzling us. And yet not many people are looking into this. I don't think there is much research done. I haven't seen many estimates of what's the cost of financial intermediation in a private equity world where we take a company that used to have like not much leverage and we cut it into pieces and every piece gets sold back to the pension funds. And on the way, there is massive due diligence, massive amounts of consultants intervening, et cetera. And that comes at a very, very high cost. And, and I think that's, that's something that should be discussed a bit more in the literature. Another exercise I did was once you take this cost, basically it's uh, all these things adding up to 100 billion uh, over a four years holding period. Uh, I remind you that it's 60 million billion of uh, earnings a year for four years, and that has cost 100 billion to bring the money to these companies, right? So to, to put uh, numbers in perspective, it, it's really extraordinary. So an interesting exercise I, I think that I uh, did here was if you start at 60 billion over a four years period, by how much you should increase your earnings beyond what it is for public equity market in order for you to recoup your 100 billion of fees and costs, right? Um, and the answer is, is there, this is what I calculated here, the breakout, break even point. The answer is you need 11% annualized growth. Now, those of you who might be used to private equity might think like, yeah, we have seen these numbers. 11% growth is not something extraordinary. That's the sorts of things that people get in practice. But in my exercise here, it is organic growth. Um, and that's another thing that I think is often missed in the literature. We do not know the growth of companies, the organic growth of companies. Um, we, it's, it's, it's not computable um, because a lot of acquisitions are externally financed. And so if we just take the earnings of companies like from CompuStack and look at how much the average earnings growth of a company is in a given year, then we get a, 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 a number uh, that is not meaningless, meaning, meaningful because uh, there is always financial, externally financed acquisitions um, which uh, influence that growth in an artificial way. Therefore, uh, we don't really know what is the organic growth of companies. I think that's a very interesting uh, academic question. And, and, but here to break even, you need 11% organic growth, which is basically unsustainable. It's impossible to reach 11% of organic growth in a year. At 11% a year, to give you an idea, it means like you increase by 50% the earnings of a company over four years. It means that you more than double it uh, 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 in less than 10 years. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty steep. So, Duda, here's a question. Yeah. Uh, is the 60 billion pre-LBO or post? The LBOs are designed to create value. If the value is greater than the intermediation cost, then the LBO is worth doing. So, so the 60 billion was the earnings at the start of the LBO, and then the break even was by how much the 60 billion needs to grow during four years for you to recoup the cost compared to public equity. Okay. Uh, the second um, question is. Aren't these markets competitive? If not, how do you think collusion occurs and is, and is enforced? So there, there was these big fines, right, in, in 2007, 2008 about like club deals and the, 
people were said, you know, it's not, it's not competitive. And it's a super interesting question because most people say, oh, these markets are competitive, so it's all, it's all good. And, you know, by definition, we're at an equilibrium. I'm going to show you things here that like tell you that we cannot be at an equilibrium. Um, if even for the buying price, um, if you look, I, I wrote this case on Hilton Hotels, for example, with Blackstone. Um, it's, 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 it's not obvious whether it was competitive or not. You, on the one hand, it was only a Blackstone making an offer. Uh, so you say, oh, then that's not competitive. It, there was only one buyer. Uh, on the other hand, they got sued, of course, because it was a public to private. So they had to justify that this price was right. Um, so so the, the investment bank had to look, ask informally all the people whether they were interested. So then you think, oh, okay, so then it was competitive. So even though there was only one buyer, um, it was competitive. But then you look again at the details and then Blackstone had a 300 million, a 300 million breakup, breakup fee. And you're like, oh, okay. So they, they were entering negotiations with these guys, 300 million breakup fee. So is that really competitive? Like if the guys would have walked out on Blackstone, they would have had to pay 300 million from their pocket to Blackstone. Um, so whether these markets are really competitive, like for buying companies is, is, is pretty unclear. And then you have whether the market for private equity funds is competitive. So whether pension funds allocating money is not done in a competitive way, in a transparent way, et cetera. But even on the buying uh, side, um, it's a lot more complicated than what often people assume. It's not clear at all that these markets are competitive. Uh, and the number of private equity people tell you that they, they manage to buy companies that not what would be the, the, the market value. But um, uh, at least in the US, it's supposed to be quite competitive because people are suing you and you need to demonstrate to a judge that you pay the right price. Um, but uh, yeah, mainly for large transactions. All right, thank you. So did it fly? So did, did we manage to get like this 11% organic growth? Well, the answer is, uh, well, kind of, because the public equity returns were the same as the private equity returns after all of the fees. So in a sense, instead of looking at the question from, was the growth enough, given that you cannot measure the growth, right? Lots of literature has, has said, are the earnings growing faster in private equity than public equity? It's very hard to compare because you, you have all this inorganic growth and you don't have the same uh, dividend policy, et cetera. So it's, it's very hard to compare. So what you say, instead of looking at the differential in growth, let me look at the end return for the investor. So after all of these fees have been paid, and the answer is then, uh, uh, it's a bit easier to measure. We have data for that. And it's, and it's about equal. It means that, that this 11% organic growth must have been achieved except that in my calculations, I assume that there was not multi, no multiple expansion. Uh, over the last 10 and 20 years, there has been a, a big multiple expansion. Multiple expansion means that all the companies become more expensive. So if companies became more expensive per dollar of earnings, then uh, you don't need 11% growth, you need less. But if going forward, we think it, 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 there's little room for further uh, uh, increase in multiples, which a lot of people believe, then you would have to have 11% growth uh, to, 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 to match uh, the, the, the return of public and private equity. And that, that's uh, pretty unlikely. But so in the past, uh, uh, it, it matched. And I will go over the details of that. So it, it came from a bit of growth in earnings, perhaps more than the peers. But again, it is not easy. So uh, Eddie Ochkis has a lot of good papers on that and Jonathan Cohn and ma many pe people uh, I have looked at that, they have great data. Uh, I, it, we, I, I still feel that the question is not completely closed because we are not completely sure about the, the, the uh, add-on acquisitions and, 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 and we don't have a universe uh, as, as well. Often it, we have to restrict ourselves to uh, a subset of transactions uh, for which we have the data available, at least in the US. And in Europe, we have technically the data, but, but, but the data are messy and, and so we, we are also facing some difficulties there, but I'm, I'm working on that separately, but it's, um, it's, it's quite difficult. Um, so um, it could also be, you know, uh, some, some, some skill at, at multiple arbitrage, it could be some luck, et cetera. But I'm gonna go back to the question on, on returns because everybody argues that it is not like that. If you ask any pension fund or endowment, they would tell you that private equity is amazing because, um, they, they, they have, um, I, I should not read the chat, but I, I, I just got caught by the question by Sophie. 
uh, about multiple expansions affecting uh, multiple uh, public markets. Yeah, yeah, so th they are. Um, so, and, and in my calculations I made, I, I wrote that it was 1.5 times for public markets. So maybe it does mean, yeah, yeah, maybe it does mean that I need to, uh, it was 11% growth that had to happen despite the multiple expansion because the 1.5 times of public equity also benefited from a multiple expansion. Yeah, it's, it's, it's possible. If, if, if indeed, if, if the multiple expansion has been the same on public markets as it is in prime market, so the, the spread between the two markets has stayed the same, then maybe it does mean that they had to deliver 11% 11, 11 growth. growth. I, I, I will check that, yeah. Um, so, and then there is Felix saying, like, uh, does it refer to market wide multiple expansion or endogenous expansion, like operating margin increase? Um, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip, skip that, that, <laughs> that question, sorry, Felix. Um, because, um, so I, I was just trying to see if, if there is no multiple expansion. The, the growth had to be 11%, that, that is clear. Um, then, then I was just saying, if the price had gone up per unit of earnings, then you wouldn't need 11% growth. Um, that, 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 that's all I was saying. Um, and the growth can happen via margin increase or by other things. In the work I've seen uh, from, from many places, I don't see much increase in margins during private degree ownership, but... Um, the, um, so, so I want to go back to the returns. Um, and here is something that can be useful maybe for 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 a broader set of people. Uh, I don't know how much people are aware of 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 these facts. Um, there are some striking facts about the different returns uh, on the stock market by different type of stocks over the last twenty five years, which explain a lot of the debate in this literature and maybe elsewhere. So basically, what you need to look at here. I'm going to see if I can highlight uh, uh, things. Uh, maybe not. Um, no, I was, already, I was going further. Okay, so what you see is is um, all these large cap indices. So Vanguard, Crisp Valuated, Fama French Valuated, Fama French Largest Decile. All of these indices between mid nineties to before the financial crisis have basically returned around seven eight percent. Okay. So not very high compared to historical averages in the US, which is more like 11%, okay? So large cap during this time period don't do very well, okay? Sometimes people call it like the last decade for stocks and so on, but very important to remember, it's only the large cap. Because if you look at this 96 to 2005 to 2009, at the bottom here, you see T. Rowe Price, you see DFA, you see Fama French, all of them, them the, the, all of the decides except the largest one, they're all at 11%. And so what this tells you is, is the small cap, mid cap in the US over that time period had 11% return, just like in any decade, basically in US stock returns. But one piece, one set of people what had less was all the large cap. They were 4% below historical average for this entire 15 years. Now, from a bit before the financial crisis to today, you can see that roughly everybody has the same returns. You have a large cap are again at the 10, 11% return, like the historical average. So that's important to remember because a lot of people say the last 10, 15 years has been exceptional for the S&P 500. It's like this Facebook, this GAFA have had like these amazing returns and, and, and that's very new, that's unusual. It's not unusual, this 10% of the large cap S&P 500 returns, et cetera, over the last 15 years is the same as the long run average in the stock returns. It's not exceptional. What was exceptional is the return of the S&P 500 before that. That was exceptional. Um, what is also exceptional, you can see, is the MSCI World and Russell 2000 are the worst performing indices in any sub-period. So you will see a lot of papers like using this as benchmarks or practitioners using this as benchmark. Coincidentally or not, this ha just happens to be the two worst performing indices. Uh, there was a paper once in finance that, that was called uh, 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 Indices have Alphas or something like that by Martin Kremers and, and his co-author. And, and this is very important to remember. Different indices have different performance. They can be constructed in a smart way or not so, so, such a smart way. So indices have alphas. 
And so um, if the choice of an index, the choice of a benchmark is not innocent. If you put on the right hand side of any uh, performance evaluation, a value weighted index of Pharma French or anything you want, on the mid 90s to 2008 is not gonna be a very strong uh, 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 benchmark you're gonna have. After that, it will be. If you take an equally weighted index, a mid cap, small cap index, it will be a strong benchmark throughout. So important to bear that in mind. And so you see the small cap and the mid cap uh, they have the same return since 2006 as they had right before, right? And over the last 10 years, yes, the returns are a bit exceptional. They're at 14% instead of 11%. So from 2010 to 2019, uh, it was a bit higher. And again, everybody has the same except MSCI World and Russell that, that were uh, uh, below. Now, once you understand that, you will understand a lot of things about what practitioners say and also what you may see in some uh, research papers. So just as a recap, remember that the large stock decile did very badly in 96 to 2009. It may not be a surprise then, but you have this rise of smart beta that we don't hear about anymore, right? But up until 2009, we heard a lot about these smart betas. What were with smart beta? It was all kinds of things that had one common point, which was they didn't value weight stocks in an index. And because the large cap did very badly, no matter what weighting scheme you are using, whether you were weighting by dividend yield or value, uh, like book to market or low vol, et cetera, as long as you avoided market cap as a weight, you would outperform the S&P 500. And so that's the smart beta people, that's all they did. They raised tons of money on the basis that their overweight was doing better than the S&P 500. That comes exactly from like the stats we just saw here. Um, since 2009 is not the case anymore. So everybody is performing the same way. We don't hear much about smart beta anymore. Um, so that's an important uh, uh, status of fact to remember. Then another important fact is that throughout the, the mid cap and small cap have the same returns, around 11%. Uh, but be careful of Russell 2000 or some other indices. They have much lower return than anyone else. Like the FTSE 600, which is the equivalent of Russell 2000, the S&P 600 has like 3% returns uh, higher than the Russell 2000. Uh, and I can go into the details of why Russell 2000 is badly constructed, uh, and they have fixed that a bit recently, but, but it, it, there is, it is like by definition that this index is not gonna perform very well. And that's why it's chosen as a benchmark because it is not a very well performing index. Um, and the other thing to remember when thinking about uh, our different puzzles in asset pricing or, or here is that the US dollar has appreciated uh, since 2006. And that partly explains why MSCI world has a lower return uh, and what, why other indices like, in, like European indices or elsewhere like emerging markets is not looking as good in US dollars because of the appreciation of the US dollar. That's a very important thing to bear in mind. Um, because one easy trick is that when you have a portfolio that is like US dollar stocks, you compare it to the MSCI world and you would always look good, uh, vice versa. If you have an international uh, uh, portfolio of stocks and, and you compare it to the S&P 500, then you will look bad. So very important to bear that in mind because here is what the, the, the usual, so this, this comes from Oxford Endowment, okay? So this is uh, the Oxford University Endowment and that's a classic way to show the performance of public equity versus private equity. You have the same for any pension funds in the US. In the paper, I show examples of pension funds and your reports. They report these sorts of statistics on which you will see that public equity is below private equity in terms of returns. But all these pension funds, let's say American pension funds, when they look at returns of public equity, their public equity portfolio is internationally diversified. So because of the appreciation of the dollar, their public equity portfolio is actually underperforming the S&P 500. But that's why they benchmark it to the MSCI world, rightly so. So their public equity portfolio is like in line with the MSCI world in terms of returns. And when they look at private equity, they say, oh my God, it's much higher. But their private equity portfolio is mainly US uh, 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 exposed. And so their private equity portfolio is a US dollar uh, focused portfolio, mainly US. And so it is just, if you look at these numbers, and it's the same for pension funds, again, I, I show that in the paper, the pension funds have, in terms of returns on private equity, they have 11% return. It's the numbers I've just shown you earlier. But in their public equity portfolio, the pension funds are more like 8%, 7% return, 
that's the MSCI world returns. That's because we are internationally diversified. And so by, by just comparing public and private, often people just forget that the country composition is very different. And that's, that's a, a very, very big problem. And we see academics in the literature in private equity using more and more MSCI world as a benchmark. And that's really, really tricky, even when they use international sets of private equity funds, because the non-US private equity funds are basically UK funds for most of them. Uh, that's not the case for MSCI world. So, so we have a, a, a big mismatch there that we need to be very careful with. So if you do any benchmarking exercise, and, and that goes also if you do like the usual regression of returns on the left hand side and, and the factors on the right hand side, these international uh, composition differences is going to be uh, driving a lot of results. So um, hopefully, as you know, in private equity, we, we use uh, PMEs to, to measure returns in a standard way. So it's the present value of what you have distributed divided by the present value of what you have invested. And uh, so if a PME is above one, it means the present value of what you have distributed is, is higher than invested. And so that's good news. Okay, So you outperform. So your NPV is positive. So you can take different indices, and from what I told you, you will understand all of these numbers. So take the column that says S&P 500, for example, any of the three columns that say S&P 500, it's just with three different data sets, and take private equity 96 to 2005. That's a famous paper by Jenkinson, Kaplan, Harris in the GF in 2010. They find a PME of 1.3, and you hear that number often if you're in private equity, 1.3 private equity outperformed by 30% in overall uh, the, the S&P 500. That's exactly what you replicate here. These vintage years uh, had a PME of 1.3 against the S&P 500, which I told you over that time period, the worst performing index, any large cap index was bad. Now in these papers, after I, I whined uh, <laughs> a lot, they did have some footnotes or they added some benchmark with, with, with mid cap, but they put the Russell 2000 as a benchmark. And against the Russell 2000, you roughly have the same result. It's a bit less, but you have a similar result. Again, because the Russell 2000 is a very special index. The papers, there was one paper back then who had used like FTSE 600, and then they had a PME close to one. Um, so you can see that here. If you use a Russell 2000 MSCI world, you would have a PME of 1.2, 1.3 uh, for the vintage 96, 2005. But if you use things like DFA micro cap, T Rho price small cap, uh, the S&P 600 small cap, then you have a PME that is very close to one. Uh, it's basically less than 2% of your extra performance. And so it's undistinguishable already statistically from one. Um, and, and so that gives a very different picture. So it means that already at the time when there was a paper by Jenkinson, Kaplan and Harris, um, against these sorts of benchmarks, it was one to one. Uh, but if you chose the large cap benchmark, then it is not. But my, what I said at the time, and, and I still say is the S&P 500 has nothing to do with what private equity invest into. Um, because it is uh, um, like Facebook, Apple, et cetera, and that's not the kind of companies that private equity uh, invest into. And, um, and funny enough, now that the S&P 500 is doing well, you have these people, the same set of offers, are saying, just leave the S&P 500, forget about it, and now use MSCI World. And you say, why, why are you changing the benchmark? And they say, well, it's because now private equity became international and the S&P 500 is always large cap, which is not what private equity does. So yeah, but it, it was not what it was doing before either. And you are using the S&P 500 and now you switch to MSCI World and it's even less what private equity does. Uh, they are not internationally diversified like the MSCI World. Uh, but somehow but, but it's accepted and, 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 and this literature has gone in, in that direction. So here you have all the benchmarks with different uh, 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 vintages and different uh, uh, benchmarks. And you can see uh, uh, why, uh, you know, only if you use MSCI World over the last uh, few vintages, you would get a, a result that is about decent, otherwise you're really close to, to, um, to public equity. So that is a full picture uh, uh, here. And, 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 you know, the papers that are coming out on this topic tend to focus on a subset of, of, of these numbers. Now, what is new in the paper, these things have been done by others, this is just descriptive stats. What is new here is that 
it's actually pretty feasible to calculate the carried interest earned by these funds. And the carried interest earned by these funds is feasible to calculate because if you take somebody who has an IR above 8%, and we usually have fund by fund returns in these databases. So if the IR is above 8%, the fund is in the money. And once the fund's in the money, they pretty quickly catch up, as we say. And then they take 20% of, of the total sum that they have generated above one, right? So if they invested 100 and they return 120, basically they took two, the 10 of profit, 20% of it. So it's pretty easy to calculate the carried interest. And, I, and in, in some instances, I had the actual value of the carried interest. And, and, and this uh, formula, this simplification is actually very close to true numbers whenever I had them. Because the carried interest is not public information. Nobody really has these numbers. Um, so with Burgess data, I was able to say how many funds are in the money right now and how much carry is due to them. Some of it can be clawed back. If they, if we, with this pandemic, they, go, they do badly. Some carried interest can be clawed back. But then if, as of December 2019, how much was due in terms of carry and, and paid? So, the answer is, in private equity, 70% of the funds were in the carry, and for buyout, 77% of the funds were in the carry. The reason is the stock market went up so much, and the hurdle rate being like 8% flat, but nearly everyone is in the carry. Everybody is getting the 20% of the absolute amount above zero, uh, which leads to an extraordinary number uh, being paid in carried interest for no outperformance, like I showed you, at least from 2006 vintage year to today, the performance is exactly the same. So if you take the carry here, so if you take private equity, uh, all the private equity funds, uh, it's $230 billion. So I let you pause on this. It's a fairly extraordinary amount of money. Um, again, this carry that is being paid is not something that covers like operating expenses. It's not like the revenues of private equity firms. The carry is cash that is paid, think of it as a bonus, it's a salary that goes to the partners of the fund in cash. It doesn't cover any expenses. So $230 billion was paid uh, by these vintage years uh, uh, to these partners in the US only, these are American funds only. And if you add the vintage years before that, because they too paid carry in 2006, 2007 and so on, if you add that, you are $370 billion of carry by private equity only, not private debt. So that would add to this number. And if you would add non-US, you would be like over half a trillion. Now pause for a second and think about the amount of money this is. We are talking about thousands of individuals that are partners of private equity firms. And we are talking about that kind of paycheck. It's an extraordinary amount of money. Yet we academics spend all of our time on talking about executive compensation and paying for luck when, you know, when the industry, you know, the oil industry prices go up and the, the CEOs of oil companies get like this 10 million or 20 million extra just for luck. We are talking about magnitudes beyond that in private equity. And it's a bit going back to what I, I started with, like we spend ages on financial intermediation talking about uh, you know, how expensive it was to do IPOs, and we write lots of papers about the cost of mutual funds. In private equity fund, it's a 7% annual cost, and we were whining about 2% of mutual funds and doing tons of research because 2% looked high, 7% in private equity. And, and the carried interest here is like orders of magnitudes beyond what CEOs get compensated, and yet we don't pay attention to it. Andre. Okay, Ludo, so here we have a couple of questions. So. Uh, right. You seem to argue that private equity funds make abnormal returns. What is the barrier to entry that prevents new competitors from undercutting incumbent funds? And I guess I probably can add to this that, you know, from the perspective of investor, if the markets are competitive, uh, they should be able to get the same expected return. I mean, it is adjusted return no matter where they invest, right? Yeah, so, so it, it seems it, like there is some... It's good you, add, you added risk-adjusted returns, right? Because um, we don't know the risk, right? Uh, we don't know the risk differential, but there is a provision of liquidity here, right? So in this pandemic, uh, private equity firms can call the money from pension funds to buy anything on the cheap. But, you know, the, the pension funds have, are providing free liquidity here, free credit lines to, 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 to private equity firms, which 
should lead to a premium. Um, you can think about the risk might be a bit uh, different as well, because we're talking about these top layers of a capital structure getting the same as public equity, which is 80% of a capital structure or 75% of a capital structure. And so if you do a, a weighted cost of ca capital, a weighted average of a returns on this entire uh, returns on assets, um, you are then below what it is for, for publicly uh, traded companies. So it's it's a bit tricky. Um, I don't think we are in equilibrium. And that's why I, I will talk next about you know what what might be not perhaps a barrier to entry because they are, they are, they are fairly light but but why are we in an equilibrium that, that that is not quite what an economist or what we would expect from like free food information uh type of market um, so isn't there an untestable issue here by being activists private equity funds are likely to incentivize firms to be more efficient yeah. uh Okay. Uh, SaaS public equity returns also benefit. Isn't it possible that yeah. private equity is improving the returns for everyone? Then yeah, comparing to public equity returns is likely to underestimate the benefit accruing from private equity. Their fees might be quite justified then. Yeah, on aggregate then, right? Because because it's the same with the activist hedge fund literature. We're so talking a lot to, to Alan Brav these days to try to paper on that. Um, you, you, you have this public good type of thing, right? So you can say from an aggregate perspective is great. The pension funds are giving money to private equity and that makes everybody more efficient. And so the entire economy benefits. And so that's great. But it's still a weird equilibrium for an economist because pension funds should then say, well, your optimal response to this is, okay, I let CalPERS and the like pay for all this money to private equity guys for them to make everybody more efficient. And me, I should just passively invest in the stock market and I'm enjoying the ride, right? Um, but there was a very good rebuttal from Blackstone that I hadn't thought about. I wrote that case study on Hilton Hotels and I hadn't thought about that. And Blackstone pointed out to me that on the day they announced the acquisition of Hilton Hotels, Marriott stock went up 7%, which is a huge amount. Um, and I don't know if it's systematic. I, I, I think that some people that looked a bit at like, if there is more practically in an industry, whether like the other companies benefit or not, like there, there are some papers around that. I don't know if people have looked at announcement of a take private transaction, the effect on other companies in the same industry. It, it rings a bell. I think some people did. But on, on that one on Hilton, I hadn't looked at that and I hadn't realized that. So it is possible that practically makes the, the, the companies that are controlling more efficient and they make the other companies in the industry more efficient. In that case, it's like the activist hedge fund literature, when you have a free riding type of problem, but we as, as economists, we need to understand, right? Um, but it's certainly a rebuttal. If you look at after my paper was out and it, 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 it did go a bit in the press and, and, and it was downloaded quite a bit. Um, there is, uh, maybe by coincidence, Steve Kaplan wrote a, 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 a tribune in, in the Wall Street Journal where basically he was not disputing any of his numbers, but he was saying, look, it's, it's, a, it's a public good that private equity delivers to a society, they make companies more efficient, et cetera. If, if that's the argument, then we need to turn back to pension funds and say, are you happy to subsidize this, this public good? Um, how does that work then? Uh, is that your fiduciary duties? Um, so, so it raises a number of interesting questions. I mean, I, so I, I think it's, it's spot on a very good question, yeah. So going on to the earlier comment about the risk of uh, these investments, there is a 2012 GF paper, liquidity risk in private equity returns, arguing that once you take factor returns out of private equity performance, the alpha is zero. Isn't that what you're arguing here? Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm, I, 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 know, I know Francesco, I, I, should, I should be promoting our work a lot more. Um, we, we, there, there are a few papers that did try to assess risk, right? Um, so I'm, I'm trying to be conservative by saying, you know, maybe we don't know what is risk and we just compare one to one with the public markets. Whenever we try to estimate risk, uh, like in the paper with Francesco in the JF, um, then, then, yeah, you know, then there is a risk premium that is required for private equity. And then, you know, the alpha, then it, in our paper, it was gross of fees. The alpha was already zero gross of fees. So net of fees, it was just like very negative. Um, so, so yes, uh, whenever we try to estimate risk, um, it was there. Uh, and in particular, liquidity risk, this free provision of, li of liquidity uh, um, is, is, um, is something that should be priced, and, and we did find evidence of that. Um, so, so it does look like a negative alpha type of situation. Um, it, it's yeah. Just, yeah. 
Uh, last clarifying cl question at the moment. So are you talking about carry over relative benchmark you mentioned of greater than one PME yeah. or against absolute return benchmark? So often people like it's, it's one of these very subtle things that the industry likes to play on. They say, oh, but we, we get a carry only beyond a hurdle rate of 8%. What they mean is I need to hit 8% and then I get 20% from zero, right? So it's a bit solo, but, it, but it's not like the high watermark in hedge funds, like that where you need to hit 8% and you will get 20% of whatever you would get beyond that, for example, right? So here is like, it's from zero. It's like once you jumped over the hurdle rate, you get everything from zero. Um, it's a slight simplification because there is a catch up phase and things like that, but, but it's very close to, to reality. And in fact, my estimate of a carry here is a lower bound because you don't even need to have 8% IR, like I assumed here, on the overall fund. It's only on your realized investments. Most uh, American funds have what is called an American carried interest structure, in which case you just need to have your winners exited first. And if you have 8% return on your winners, then you get 20% on whatever you know, the winners have generated for you. So you get a, a quite a, a lot more than what I've uh, assumed here because you are much earlier on in, in the carry. So this is like a very conservative estimate of how many funds are in the carry. It, 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 for leverage buyout in the US, over these vintage years, we are probably 90% of the people are in the carry uh, because all they had to do was to get 8% on their winners. And so if you cannot get that on winners with this rising market, then, you know. Uh. Well, Sophie has some suggestions about some additional paper uh, about positive externalities. I'll let you read it later. So let's move yeah. on. Yeah, so, so, so the, the positive externalities is, 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 is an interesting question. Um, that, and, and it's very similar to what uh, the discussions around uh, the hedge funds activists, um, because they, they bear the cost of the activism and, and, and then it was, uh, there is even more visible, right? Because they bear the cost of activism and then and, and, and they, they, they target some companies and then the price goes up and all these passive guys benefited from it by doing nothing. Um, so. And, and then there is a question. So when we talk about executive compensation as well, and there is all these, these, these papers about it, here we're in a situation where not only, uh, uh, you know, at best the alpha is zero, and like Francesco and I would agree with him, the alpha is probably negative once you risk adjust, um, they have got a huge reward for this. Um, and uh, uh, on top of that, this reward is taxed as a capital gain, which is again, like, I, I, I don't think I will have time to explain exactly how you know, they structure that to make it happen. I, 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 I'm happy to, to do that with, with people if they are interested offline, but um, it, it's quite extraordinary. So basically it is a bonus for, for, for good performance that they are receiving, but it is somehow structured as a capital gain and they get paid, uh, they, get, uh, they, they pay less taxes on, 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 on this. Um, most of these billionaires, um, so and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm skipping a bit by that slide, but but in the paper I counted with the billionaires on the Fortune 400 list. Uh, it's an interesting list actually. So you have all kinds of people who are like hedge funds uh, and private equity guys, and clearly they, they became billionaire because of a carry. And what would be very interested is over their lifetime, did they deliver positive NPV or not? So when you take Paulson, for example, who I think retired this week, he decided to to to, to drop it. I'm not sure of, uh, if over his entire life, his, his NPV is positive. He did get a high rate of return when he had less money under management, then he had more money under management and he didn't get a good rate of return. So the total NPV of person might very well be positive. It's, 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 it's negative. It's, it's a very interesting calculation that I think we should be doing uh, for a number of his star guys. And, and if his NPV is negative and you put next to it his wealth, uh, you know, he's not gonna give back his wealth after his disappointing performance. And it, it, it's, it's an interesting uh, uh, visualization. You know, you, 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 get, you deliver a negative NPV over your lifetime, but you have uh, this immense wealth. Um, so, so I think a lot more work could be done there. Uh, here, I, I've, I've taken the billionaires that are from private equity, and all I did was looking at their multiple of money. That's the only thing I could observe. So how much money they, they receive from investors and how much they delivered. And the answer is before fees, we are at 1.8 and notice how close they are from one another. All these top four guys are very close to one another, 1.8 gross. If you take out the carry, which again, we can do with quite high certainty, we're at 1.6. And I didn't take out the management fees because I didn't know exactly that there you need a lot more assumptions. But if you do uh, take a bit out for, 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 for uh, management fees, you'll be at 1.5 multiple. 
And 1.5 multiple is 11% return for four years, which is in general what we find is the average holding period for private equity investment. So it would mean that these big firms, we would need more detail on their, on, on, on their cash flows, but they are not far or they are at what the stock market return has delivered. Um, and, 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 and yet have, have accumulated amazing amounts of carry and compensation. So I think these are like big questions to, to really look at, especially when I contrast with the amount of time we spend in academia on, on questions of CEO pay and so on. I understand we have more easily the data available there, but, but, but I find the magnitudes to be uh, uh, magnitudes uh, different. There was a recent uh, paper in, in the GFE. Uh, I did tell the authors about that. Um, but, but Mike Weisbach and, and Doc Sensoy have this paper saying that there is this massive dispersion in returns by investors. And when I looked at their data, I, I couldn't see much dispersion. I, I could see like, you know, one was like 80% of, 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 of the LPs, so the investors were be, below like minus 1% be, be, uh, average and plus 1% above the average. So it didn't look very dispersed. And, and the data are not comprehensive. We don't have all of the funds for all of these LPs. Uh, so the ones for which I have all of the data, it's available publicly, it's on their website, is like these five largest investors in the US in private equity. Look at their money multiple, it's nearly the exact same number. There is no dispersion in returns for investors. These guys are all holding the, the market portfolio. And this 1.5 multiple of money, again, is about what the stock market would deliver. Um, and, and, and yet, they, when you read what they write, they seem to celebrate these performances. They are very happy with their private equity. They got $1.5 per dollar they invested, but the stock market delivered the same. So that's uh, um, a bit puzzling. Why don't people get it? Uh, uh, I, I would recommend the paper by, by, by uh, uh, Sophie and, and, and others. I, I, I think we need to spend a lot more work uh, uh, on, on IR. And everybody says they get it, but, but I don't think, People really understand what the problem is. This is an example of what is written in 10K filings, SEC documents, where you have a firm like Apollo saying, I have a 39% gross IR. 39%, if, if it was a rate of return, it would have multiplied money by more than 2,000 uh, from 1990 to today. That's what 39% is. 39% is you double your money every year. So just do the math, you know, every year, one, two, four, eight, a 16. At this pace, you very quickly have an amazing amount of money that doesn't square up with the investor's experience. And so we use this weird way, uh, or we allow people to use this weird way of, of calculating returns. We even teach it at business schools. Uh, we do tell people not to do it too much, but we don't really tell them why. And the textbooks miss the point on IR. The problem of IR is when the cash flows are endogenous, when you can exit your winners first and hold on to your losers, then your IR goes through the roof and, 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 and goes stupid because of your investment assumption. And that's not in the textbooks. And that's not what we tell the students. And therefore, we tell the students that, oh, don't use IR because there may be two solutions or this or that. This hardly ever happens. That's not the problem with IR. The problem with IR is that once you can time strategically your winners and your losers, or you have access to like borrowing, like credit lines and the like, you can just get this IR through the roof with the reinvestment assumption kicking in. Uh, and, 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 and that creates stupid numbers. Uh, and, and so we have to think a lot more about that because that, that in my experience, is something that even if people say they know, they don't know. And, 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 and we, we keep on seeing things like this, statements like this. Um, you know, when, when we talked earlier about why did these guys became so big? Uh, there was once at a conference at UNC, with maybe some of you were there, the senior, a senior guy at Apollo came and talked to us academics about how great they were and told us, you know, we raised the largest fund ever in private equity. And he said, but you know, no wonder we have 39% return annualized over the last 30 years. So of course we raised the largest fund ever. And you're like, nobody has 39% return a year. It doesn't exist as a number. This is really impossible. Um, and, and, and so it's, I think we, we, we need to, uh, again, there is a good paper, uh, uh, by, by Sophie and co-offers on, on this, but we need to do a lot more work on, 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 on these issues. I think really people don't, don't, don't get that. Um, another thing that I think that we underestimate as economists is the power of the multiple layers of agencies that there is uh, in this world. We tend to think in a very simple way. We say, if somebody's a willing buyer and somebody's a willing seller, then it must be good. The problem is that is not how life works. 
the, the object is complex and there are 10 layers between the principal and the agent. So the, the guy who's buying private equity works for the private equity division of a public pension fund. If that guy says this is a bad deal, this guy lost, loses his job, okay, or her job. So this person is gonna tell the print, uh, her boss that it is good. And the boss understand maybe enough of private equity to understand that it's not quite good, but this boss also has a boss. And then we go to say, you know, it's, it, it, it's okay, right? And the, the end principle is a pensioner, uh, maybe the board of trustees, but even then, you know, they, they want to have good news to announce rather than bad news. Or, so the, the principle is very far away and the principal doesn't have a knowledge to understand that something is going wrong. So we, we, we fail to appreciate the multiple layers of agency conflicts there is in asset management, in particular when the asset is complex. The end user, the end, the principal, the real principal, has no clue about the, 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 the complexity of the asset, but an IR is not a rate of return and all these things. Um, so that's one issue. No, no, uh, there are two similar questions that uh, let me just read them both together. Your results seem to suggest free riding problem has been solved in the market. Investors are indifferent between private equity funds and public market returns, same average returns. All that may be happening is that activists are capturing the excess returns from, the, from their private equity investment through their fees. Uh, okay. as in, as in, also, as an investor, if I receive the net of fees return on private equity or public equity, why should I care how big the net fees are being paid? Yeah, so, so um, great questions. So first, again, risk adjusted is not clear that this is, this is uh, you know, the alpha would be negative, but um, the, the, if you talk to pension funds right now, they would not tell you, oh, the returns are about the same, so I'm, I'm fine, it's an equilibrium. The pension funds are still convinced that they will get more returns with private equity. When you read the latest of CalPERS saying, I'm gonna double down in private equity, they're not saying because I get as much as public equity. They tell you because I will get much more than with public equity. And you say in the past, it was, not already, it was already not the case. So like, what makes you believe that? And what makes them believe that is like, that they are not looking at these numbers. They are not, they are not doing these calculations. They are basing their belief on what the consultants are selling them. The consultants are conflicted, et cetera, et cetera, because of the fees that the consultants make by, by selling the expensive product. About the, the thing about like, why, why is it a problem? How much fees I paid if after fees I get the same return as, as public equity and imagine that the risk is the same, okay? The reason for that is that we as economists, we can look at the past, but we need to also think about the future. So if a fee structure is such that when the returns have been very high, you get the same after fees, you can simulate what would happen if the returns were not as high. And if they're not as high going forward, if you're in a low interest rate environment going forward, then the expected returns start to be a bit tricky. Okay, so that's, that's uh, uh, one reason. But you can also think about you know, inequalities, wealth, wealth inequalities. If some people are walking home with like $230 billion or more, uh, uh, you can think about you know, whether this is you know, a fair share of, of, of the deal, the, the pensioners put money into private equity to earn more, and you say, well, you didn't earn more. We didn't consider there was any risk premium. You got as much as with public equity, and by the way, we pocketed all the extra, and, 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 and it's all cool. Notice as well that another thing that economists tend to think is that they think that, that the, they, call, they talk about value creation, practitioners do that too. They say, you know, if, if the money, if, if the value of a company went up from like 100 to 200, there was 100 of value creation the hundred didn't come from the sky, right? You may have some competitors that have suffered. You may have had some employees that have suffered. You have all kinds of externalities. So we don't know exactly how much is really created. So it, it's, it, it, a lot of it might be a wealth transfer, but you know, they, 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 so the, the, not, not all the increase on the, of, of the value of a company is just coming from the sky just because people were more efficient and so it was all cool. And, and this, this is, you know, pure wealth creation. Um, I, there are a lot more externalities out there than, than, than that. Right, thank you. Um, so that's uh, uh, some of the takeaways that I, that, that I would list. I'm gonna add another point as well in, 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 in the spirit of, of, of a talk about what economists I think are underestimating often is, is how much uh, in practice people make choices based on how fun it is. If I'm telling my students, you know, do you want a job in fixed income? Um, like trading bonds, I would not get a single hand up. It's, it's boring. 
um, if, if, if I tell them who wants to be in private equity, everybody wants to go. So yes, it's because they get paid a lot more, but, but it's also, it's just like a lot more interesting to invest in companies, to do private equity. It's, it's, I, I cannot think of anything in finance that is more interest, interesting and exciting than investing in private equity. And that, you know, creates some biases. Some people are then therefore more keen to do something interesting than doing something boring. You know, we, we ourselves tend to do research we find more interesting uh, uh, and exciting. Uh, and maybe it's not the one with the highest social value, but we do the one that is most exciting. And a same, similar thing may happen in investing. Okay. Um, so I'm close to, to the end and I'm keen on, on taking questions. So um, there was a debate with David Robinson where, where David actually his entire uh, counter argument to what I just said was around uh, the public good that is delivered by private equity. Uh, so you can hear uh, what, what he has to say um, and, and what I had to say. Um, and if you want even more than that, you can you can uh, buy my book, but I'm going to promote here without any uh, <laughs> of, uh, um, shyness. Um, also, I, the reason I'm also showing it is that it is actually designed as a textbook. So if some of you are doing private equity courses, I've put all the new slides uh, on the website of a, of, of a book. So all 16 chapters have all the slides there for you to use in class. Um, and um, the, I'm working on the Excel spreadsheet that go with all these exercises. So uh, if you want resources for a private equity course or related, then um, this is there for you. Thank you. All right.